1 John chapter 2, verse 3. And by this we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. Whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word in him, truly the love of God is perfected. By this we know that we are in him. Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. This is God's word. Thanks be to God. You guys may be seated. Joe, join me in prayer one more time. Lord, we thank you so much again for bringing us here this morning and revealing to us the truth of your word. We ask and pray that you'll grant us hungry hearts this morning, open hearts this morning, setting aside all distractions, all issues in life that is suffocating us and that is blinding us from seeing the truth. Help us to see the goodness of your word this morning. We love you, Lord, and we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you guys are taking notes, the title of today's message is You Better Check Yourself. You Better Check Yourself. Friends, let me ask us a question that we all perhaps have asked ourselves during our Christian journey once or a lot more than once. Friends, how do you know if you're a true Christian? How do, you know that if, how do you know if you are truly saved or not? How do you know if the person sitting next to you, in front of you, or behind you is someone who is truly a believer of Jesus Christ? Some will argue that you will never know, and you will just have to wait until you die to find out. Others will define Christians as those who simply attend church services on Sundays, and that is what it means to be a Christian. Some Christian groups will tell you that being baptized is a clear sign that you're a Christian. Other groups argue that spiritual gifts, your spiritual gifts, such as gift of tongues or gift of prophecy, is a sure, th- sure sign that you are truly saved. However, we see many who've been baptized or confirmed, even in our church, who no longer are part of any church, who no longer consider themselves as Christians. And we know many devoted Christians who don't necessarily have the gift of tongues, who don't necessarily have the gift of prophecy, but we can clearly tell that they love Jesus and they are true Christian. So then we're going to ask a question What are we to make of all this? Is there a way for us to verify, to authenticate, to see if we're a genuine follower of Jesus Christ? 1 John is a letter. It's a letter that John is writing to churches full of young believers who've been recently attacked and affected by these false teachings of the world. And as a result, many began in the church, many began to doubt about Jesus' identity. They began doubting that Jesus is fully God, and they began doubting that Jesus is actually fully man as well. And to make matters worse, these false teachings have also caused many doubts among the church members regarding their faith, regarding if they're truly Christians or not, regarding how it's okay for them to keep on living a life of sin because their false understanding of God's grace enables them to sin away because Jesus has already died for all of their sins. And so in response, John provides a litmus test for all believers, a way for us to check and verify to see if people in the church are genuinely saved or not, and to see if they are indeed in the family of God or if they are simply just acting, pretending, and lying. In the previous passages, John has been relaying the message that he heard from Jesus firsthand regarding this special invitation, this VIP backstage access, not only to meet God, not only to encounter God, but to know him in a deep, personal, and intimate way. This idea of having fellowship with God initially seemed far-fetched for many back then because of the problem of sin. Because of sin... The once perfect and harmonious fellowship between God and humanity has been severed and there was nothing people could ever do to reconcile with God. However, despite sin, 
Despite our rebellion, despite Adam's rebellion and disobedience, God never gave up on his people. And God provided a way for this one's broken relationship to be reconciled again. This way, the only way, was through Jesus Christ, his only begotten son. We saw last week in 1 John chapter 2, verses 1-2, to 2, that Jesus, being our advocate, who fights for us, as well as Jesus being our propitiation or our uh, atonement, who fully satisfies God's wrath, who fully satisfies the punishment for our sin on the cross. And now anyone who accepts and believes Jesus as Lord are now given second chances, are now given another opportunity to be in this incredible, loving relationship, this fellowship with God, to know God personally, and to be in a deep communion with him. Going back to the initial question that I asked you guys, how do we know? How do we know if we're truly saved? How do we know if we're truly a Christian? Friends, to be a Christian literally means, that word Christian literally means someone who belongs to Christ. There's this famous saying in the Korean culture. They say they're, they're born Christians because they were born into a Christian household. But friends, the word Christian literally means someone who belongs to Christ. Just because you were born in a Christian household does not mean you belong to Christ. Someone who acknowledges Jesus as Lord over their lives, rather than themselves, rather than any other idols, that is who a true Christian is. To be a Christian means to accept God's gracious invitation to know him and to be in a loving relationship with him. That means it's not a one and done deal. Going back to the marriage reference that I mentioned earlier, although, you only get, although you, your wedding day is one day, you're committing yourself on your wedding day for the marriage, aren't you? Just because you said, I do, on your wedding day doesn't give you the excuse to not treat your relationship with your spouse as a, as a marriage relationship. It has to be a daily commitment and a confession. Friends, I believe there's a big difference between knowing about God versus knowing God personally. Knowing about God versus knowing God personally. And a true Christian is someone who simply is not someone who simply knows a lot about the Bible, who knows a lot about God. There are many atheists in this world who devote their entire lives studying the Bible just so that they can refute against God and his existence. So knowing a lot about God doesn't guarantee salvation. You see the word to know in the original language used in today's passage is not referring to facts. It's not referring to knowledge or information, but it's referring to a relationship. A relationship. For example, although we might know a lot about our favorite celebrities, although we might know a lot about our favorite athletes, at the end of the day, we don't know them personally, do we? And to make matters worse, not to offend you, but you don't mean much to them at all. Perhaps just one of the many millions and million other followers on their Instagram page that they don't really even care to know personally. Do they follow you back on Instagram? Probably not. However, through Jesus Christ as our advocate and our atonement, we are now invited not to only know a lot about God through the Bible, but he now takes us behind the curtains. He takes us backstage to know God personally. The creator of the world, he invites us to know him personally as our father, as our provider, as our protector. As John is writing this letter, many in the church, they claimed that they know, they know Jesus or they claimed that they know God. They were claiming to be true believers, true disciples of Jesus Christ, to be in a true and personal relationship with God. Yet judging from their actions, 
judging from their life habits, their conduct, and the choices that they make in life, John was not fully sold. So John graciously encourages them to check themselves, to see if they really know God and are known by God, or if they're just acting, lying, pretending. In today's passage, John offers two ways, two ways to evaluate, to assess, and to check ourselves. We can check ourselves in two ways, one through our obedience, and one through our loving commitment. So we can check ourselves to see if we're a true believer or not through our obedience and through our loving commitment. So number one, our relationship with God can be verified through our obedience. Look with me in verse 3. And by this we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. John starts off saying, by saying, by this, which refers to keeping God's commandments. One way we can check to see the authenticity of our faith is through our obedience to God's word or by keeping his commandments. Now this word, to keep, can also be translated as to treasure. Or to guard. And this should be the attitude that we have when it comes to obeying the word of God. We ought to fight, to treasure, to guard his commandments and obedience as true followers of Christ. Also, the word to keep has this continual aspect, which is, as it is written in the present tense, it has this continual aspect which reminds us that this obedience is not a one and done Deal. Just because you said, I believe in Jesus Christ, you raise your hand, you pray the prayer during one of the retreats in youth group, does not guarantee salvation for the rest of your life. It has to be a daily commitment to obey God's command. One of the ways to know or to check, to check ourselves to see if you're a true Christian, to see, uh, is to see if you desire to obey God and his word. This means if you have absolutely zero desire, if you have absolutely zero desire in doing what God says, and if his commandments written in the Bible are of little importance to you, then that should serve as a red flag. Friends, John, the author of this letter, makes it very clear for us. You cannot be a believer without obedience. And vice versa. You cannot obey God unless you are a believer. You can fake it, but you are not a believer without obedience. And you cannot obey God unless you are a believer. Our obedience to God's word and his commands are clear proof and evidence that we know God personally. So then what does it mean to obey? What does it look like in our everyday life to obey God? I believe the obedience that God demands of us is twofold, both outward and inward. It's both the outward conduct as well as the inner motive and the attitude. Friends, if we're to be honest, there are times where we obeyed our parents in our outward actions, yet we did it grudgingly in our hearts. Anyone guilty of this? I feel like I'm guilty of this all the time. We're fine with our outer conduct, trying to obey our parents out of respect and out of love, yet deep down in our hearts, our motive and our attitude is at times very negative. That's not the type of obedience that God desires. In fact, that's the exact kind of hypocrisy that Jesus came to call out among the Jewish religious leaders. You see, as Jewish religious leaders, their outer conduct... Their actions always appear to be righteous, holy, and upright. And because of this, they were highly respected among the Jews. However, Jesus comes and calls out their bluff. Jesus calls out their bluff because Jesus sees right through their hollow outer actions and sees that the reason behind all of their righteous acts, the reason behind all of their righteous, holy conduct were not for the glory of God, but rather for themselves. Friends, to be a Christian 
and to know God is ultimately to have a change of lordship in your life. Let me say that again. To be a Christian and to know God personally is to have a change, a transformation of lordship in your life. It is humbly acknowledging that the throne of your life does not belong to you, but belongs to God. If you struggle with keeping God's commands, if you struggle with obeying God's word, it's ultimately because you are still sitting on the throne of your life. We want to pick and choose what commands and what words we want to obey, don't we? But at the end, that's not true obedience. By doing so, we're actually placing ourselves above God and his commands, thinking we have the authority, we have the power to approve or disapprove which commands are worth keeping, which commands are not worth keeping. And by doing so, we're actually treating God like our genie, right? Or like a vending machine. Give me what I want or else. This is what was happening. This was exactly what was happening in the churches back then. You see, although they were claiming to be true believers, they were not treating sin seriously because they felt as though they were safe and secure in the blood of Jesus Christ. John told us that Jesus died on the cross for all our sins, past, present, and future. That means we can keep on sinning. That means we can sin away because the more we sin, the more that will give opportunities for the grace of God to shine. And so in the name of God's grace, they kept on sinning away. Although they claimed to know God, there was a clear disconnect between what they said versus what they, how they lived their lives. From their lips, they were claiming to be a follower of Christ. Yet how they lived their lives, their conduct, their lifestyle, was in great contrast. A life indulging in sin without obedience. This is what John is calling out in his letter Today. Friends, look with me in verse 4. Verse 4, it says, Whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments, is a liar. And the truth is not in him. John is reminding everyone to check themselves, because without true obedience, you are nothing but a liar. Simply pretending, faking to know God, when in reality, all your devotion, all your allegiance... It's flawed. Friends, one clear way to check ourselves or check the authenticity of our faith, to see if we truly know God or not, is by observing our obedience. Because obedience reveals the genuineness of our faith. The obedience of our lives reveals the genuineness of our faith. Throughout the Bible, God places heavy emphasis and priority on obedience. 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 22, Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice. Hosea chapter 6, verse 6, For I desire steadfast love and not sacrifice. I don't know how important it is for you, but for God, but to God it was his utmost priority. The reason why God was so pleased with his one and only son, Jesus Christ, and dying on the cross was not because he sacrificed himself on the cross, but was because ultimately he fully and perfectly obeyed the commands of his father, something that we were never able to do. This is why Jesus was our only perfect candidate to be our advocate and to be our atonement, because he perfectly obeyed God when we couldn't. Jesus, as our representative, did what we can never do, perfect obedience, so that in return we can receive what we don't deserve, which is this incredible, gracious invitation to be in a loving relationship with God. And the more we grow to know God, the more we grow in our obedience. And the more we grow in our obedience, the more we grow in our love for God. It's like this endless cycle. 
The more we know God, the more we can't help ourselves but want to obey God. And the more we begin to obey God and His Word, the more we can't help ourselves but to fall in love with God all the more. Which leads us to our second point. Not only should we check ourselves through our obedience, but we also have to check ourselves through our love or our loving commitment. Look at me in verse 5. But whoever keeps his word or whoever obeys his word, in him truly the love of God is perfected. By this we may know that we are in him. Friends, our inner motive behind why we desire to obey God's commands shouldn't be out of anything but love. For the Jewish religious leaders, it was clear that all of their obedience was not driven by their love for God, but rather their love for themselves. The reason why they appeared to obey God's word was because they wanted fame, honor, respect, power from others. They were using the concept of obedience to get ultimately what they wanted, which was respect from people. Yet in God's eyes, if the, if the inner motive is not love, any and all obedience is nothing but a lie and is absolutely meaningless. If your obedience is not driven out of love for the Lord, then we cannot call that obedience. Friends, why do you strive to obey God's word and his commands? It's because, is it because pastor tells you every Sunday? For some, maybe it's out of fear. Because we don't want to be condemned and we don't want to end up in hell. Yet this is a miserable life. Because no obedience would ever be good enough to rescue you from sin. Right? If Jesus truly demands perfect obedience from you, we would have absolutely no hope in life. Because none of us, none of us would ever be able to be perfectly obedient. For others, they obey out of legalism, right? It's just what we're taught since a very young age. We've grown up in church all our lives, and that's, it's been taught, it, that's what the church or that's what our parents taught us to do. And it's what good Christians should do to obey God's word not break any laws. But when you look at today's passage, John reminds us that true obedience ought to flow out of no other motive than our genuine love for our Lord. Not out of fear, not out of guilt, not out of shame, not out of this legalistic mindset, but has to be out of our love for the Lord. We want to obey God and his commands because we love him. And the more we strive to keep his word, the more our love for God is perfected, which is another way of saying growing in maturity. Friends, we shouldn't have the mentality of, I need to obey God's word, but rather, I want to obey God's word, or I get to obey God's word. John chapter 14, verse 15 says, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. Meaning, it ought to be a byproduct or a result of our love for the Lord. Which means, if you flip that out, if you flip that, if we speak and if we say we love God, yet we are not obedient, that means we do not genuinely love the Lord. Obedience to our Lord's command is the clear evidence of our love for him. When we are sitting on the throne of our lives, we always calculate, don't we? We always calculate and we weigh the commands to see if it's worth it for us, if it's worth it for us to obey or not. But if you genuinely love Jesus, regardless of what the command might be, your love for him is more than enough reason to obey. Because your gaze, your focus, is not upon the command itself, but upon the one who gives the command. My hope and prayer is that by God's grace, all of you will be married eventually. And when you do get married, the reason why you want to please your spouse, the reason why you want to love your spouse, 
and provide them in a generous manner is not because of the specific command or a specific word, but it's because it's them. It's your spouse, right? The reason why you want to love them is because it's them, not because of the content, but because of who they are. Friends, as God's love reaches us, it, ought, it not only brings salvation, but also enables us to obey out of love, not out of guilt, not out of fear, not out of any other reason. But as you received Jesus Christ as a Lord and Savior, out of that births this desire to obey God and his word. It's like this endless cycle, going back to what I said earlier. The more we know God, the more we want to love him. And the more we love him, the more we want to obey God. And the more we obey God, the more we can't help but to know more of God. So then what does this love look like? More often than not, we tend to understand love as a feeling, as an emotion, or even an action. Right? That's how it is used oftentimes in the world that we're living in today. However, judging from the context, the type of love that is mentioned in today's passage is within regards to commitment. Commitment. Like if you ever attend weddings, that's what is preached about. That's what is talked about, right? Love is not a feeling or an action, but you are actually committing yourselves to each other before God and before man. It's a vow, right? It's a commitment. Look at me in verse 6. Verse 6 says, Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. To say you love God is to make a commitment. To make a commitment to abide in him. To say you love God is to make a commitment to abide in him. Commitment to obey. Commitment to know him more and more each, each day. We saw this word abide earlier in John chapter 15. When Jesus refers to himself as a true vine and we as branches. And he calls us as branches to abide in him as the true vine. Have you ever seen a branch that is alive, that is detached from the vine? A branch, no matter how precious it looks, no matter how big it is, no matter how beautiful it might look, if it is detached from the vine, it is nothing more than firewood. It's dead. It's lifeless. Likewise, to say you love God is to make a commitment to abide in Jesus, the true vine, each and every day. Rather than making a commitment to abide in something else, rather than making a commitment to be self-sufficient and independent apart from Christ, no, to love the Lord is to make a commitment as a branch to abide in the true vine, the true source of life in Jesus Christ. Friends, to love God means you are making an active commitment to obey His commands and to know Him more each day rather than picking and choosing only certain aspects of His commands. Whenever, wherever we are in our walk with God, I pray that we will check ourselves, not just today because we're forced to, but we'll check ourselves every morning we wake up, every day. Check ourselves in our obedience in our love, and find rest, comfort, and true joy in knowing that we not only are given this incredible and amazing opportunity to know God, but also to be known by God. It's crazy because a lot of us, it would be shocking if any one of the celebrities or famous athletes DM us, right, on Instagram saying, hey, I know you. And here we are, calling ourselves Christians. We have full, direct access to God, the creator himself, who knows you personally, and who's desperately waiting to spend time with you each and every day, yet we are saying, no, I'm not interested. And we take full advantage of this opportunity to know God and to be known by God. Which leads us to our final point, application or practical implication. What does that mean for us? 
After hearing today's message, perhaps some of you guys are a bit discouraged and have doubts and questioning your faith. But Pastor Gunn, I, I, I think I have the desire to obey God's word, and I think I have the desire to obey God's command, but I feel as I keep failing. Over and over and over again, does that mean I'm a liar? Does that mean my authenticity is fake? And I'm not a true Christian? Friends, if we go back to today's passage, what we need to remember is that our God does not demand of us perfect obedience. As the, uh, um, he's not demanding perfect obedience from each and every one of us. That would be impossible. Likewise, the Bible never says we ought to be the Christ or be the Savior. If so, we'll all be in trouble because we've all failed and will continue to fail to be the Savior of our own lives. Unless you are Jesus, every Christian is going to fail in their obedience in one way or the other. John made it very clear that we will fail and we will commit sin along the way. Not only that, John also reminds us in 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Friends, our God is not a God who demands of us sinless perfection. And he's not asking of us to be a savior. Instead, what he is asking of us is to cling to the true Savior in Jesus Christ, to make a daily effort and commitment to abide in him as the true vine. We ought to declare, not independence, but dependence, utter dependence upon the true vine in Jesus Christ. Despite our mistakes, despite our failures, to confess honestly to acknowledge that we cannot ever save ourselves, that we cannot do this alone, that you are not the God of your own lives and we are in desperate need of a true Savior to lead us, to guide us through the truth of his word. Going back to verse 6 of today's passage, he says, whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. Friends, although there will be times when we stumble, when we fail, when we fall, as a Christian, the direction that our lives are headed, the path or the trajectory that we are walking ought to be towards Christ rather than away from Him. Towards love and obedience rather than disobedience. Friends, the amazing grace and the incredible hope that we have in Christ is that even in our worst failures, even in our worst days, he's patient with us and he desires for us to turn around. I want to know something even crazier. Because of Jesus Christ and what he has done for us on the cross, even when we have fallen in the depths of our sin, when we feel as though there's no way that God will ever forgive us, there's no way that God will ever leave, uh, ever, ever accept us, there's no way because we feel so distant from God. If I can just embed a, a, an image in our heads, you know, if you guys ever been to a big airport, there's this moving walkway. We don't even need to walk. You just stand and what happens? It carries you to the destination. Friends, that's the grace that we have received from our Lord Jesus Christ. Even when we feel as though we've hit rock bottom, even when we feel as though we've turned the complete other direction and ran as fast as possible or far as possible from the Lord, by the grace of Jesus, He has not let you go. And He's carrying you to the finish line, just desiring for you to turn from your sin and to run the Savior who waits with open arms. For some of us, we've been heading towards the wrong trajectory for quite some time. And God is beckoning us. He calls us by name to turn around, to run to his loving arms. Friend, that's repentance. Repentance literally means to turn around, to turn the opposite direction. So friends, may we turn to him this morning. 
even in, our dis- even in our obedience, even in our commitment to love and to abide in him, we need his help. We cannot do obedience on our own. We need his help because we cannot do anything apart from him. The reason why he demands of our obedience and our love is because there's nothing better in this world. God is the creator of the world. If that's the case, and he tells us that there's nothing better, there's nothing greater in this world, and he offers something that is the greatest, who are we to think otherwise? For those of us who are stuck in our failure, stuck in our sin, let's ask God to help us to turn our gaze from our failures to him. We're so fixated, only focusing on how much we have failed our Lord. He's asking us to lift up our eyes to see the Lord. For those of you guys who are so blind to your sin, like the Jewish religious leaders, let's ask God to reveal to us our sin and how it has been affecting our relationship with God and affecting our relationship with others. Next time we'll gather together, we'll talk about that aspect of loving others and how sin affects our relationship with others. For those of you guys who struggle with doubt, let's ask God to remind us of his promises and our new identity in him. Wherever we are in our walk with God, let's spend some time evaluating where we stand before God. And let's ask him to meet us where we are this morning. We do that. Let's bow our heads in prayer and let's ask God to just maybe reveal to us where we are in our trajectory of life when it comes to our faith. And I think for some of us, we really need to do some self-evaluation. It's been a while since we've actually seen a reflection of ourselves through the words of God uh, uh, with Scripture. We look at our face, a reflection of our face in the mirror every day, but it's been a while since we've seen a reflection of who we are through the spiritual mirror in Scripture, and God's Word. And as we do so, maybe we can pray for God to reveal to us our blind spot, to reveal to us the hidden areas of sin, to reveal to us how that is affecting our obedience, how that is affecting our, our relationship with God, how that is affecting the way we love God. Let's spend a minute in prayer, and then we'll respond with a song. Let's pray together.